so thank you everybody for joining us for our two o'clock session. Um, we are really excited to have uh, our good friend, uh, a uh, leadership award recipient at one of our past galas and member of our scientific advisory council, uh, Dr. Cliff McDonald, um, to present on CDC's ongoing efforts to make C. diff count. Um, he is being supported in his presentation by Preeta Cuddy uh, and Andrew Janay, so they may uh, pop up on screen or on the chat to answer any questions you guys have. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Cliff uh, to get started on your presentation. Thanks for doing this, Cliff. Well, thank you, Christian, for uh, being so flexible and making this virtual summit happen. Um, and thank you all for spending your afternoon here with us. Um, and we wanted to take this opportunity, although as, as you imagine, things are pretty crazy at the CDC right now, we didn't want to pass up this opportunity to, to reach you all with some of the things we're trying to do to <clears throat> continue to make more C. diff cases count and more apparent to people. And we wanted to talk about some of the recent um, uh, data that has come from the CDC about um, Clostridium difficile infections uh, and go over those and put them, try to put them in some context with one another um, so that you can better understand them and talk about these uh, recent estimates and papers. Okay, um, so the next slide, let's see. Um, so the first report I wanna highlight is what came out, I. Now, what month was it? Well, it was last fall. <laughs> it might have been a decade ago from everything that's happened since. But last fall, the Antibiotic Resistance Threats Report, I'm trying to think what month it was. Um, but the Antibiotic Resistance Threat, Antibiotic Resistance Threats Report, as you know, had first been published back in 2013. And at that time, we were using the best data available at that time. And and these things continue to evolve as more data sources become available. And if you remember from 2013, it was 18 different antibiotic resistant uh, threats um, um, ranked in different categories from uh, urgent threats, serious threats, and uh, important threats. I can't remember actually the right term for the last category. Uh, Clostridium difficile both times in 2013 and 2019 is an urgent threat. Um, and uh, many of these threats have decreased in number of um, infections uh, and number of deaths. Clostridium difficile among them. Um, both times, uh, let me think in 2013, um, yes, in both times, in 2013 and in 2019, for Clostridium difficile infections, we uh, looked at hospitalized cases. So this is not all of them, and we'll talk about that some more, how it's a part of the picture. And so we have different surveillance systems, and this one we used for this, I'll talk about some more in a couple of slides, is the Emerging Infections Program. And that was used um, both in 2013 and in this 2019 report. Um, but it's just the hospitalized cases. And part of the reason we did that is because that's how all the antibiotic, all the other antibiotic resistant threats in this report were also talked about. So these are cases who are uh, who either develop Clostridium difficile infection while in the hospital, um, hospital onset infections, or uh, patients who develop their infection in the community but get admitted uh, right around the time that they're diagnosed. Um, and this is usually within the first couple days of admission or right before admission. Sometimes it's the reason why they're getting hospitalized. So it is a subset of all cases, the more serious ones, albeit. Uh, and you can see the number here, it's just under 224,000 infections of hospitalized cases. Uh, and that's down from 250,000 uh, in 2013 um, and uh, 12,800 deaths. These are estimated number of deaths and uh, 1 billion in costs. The uh, deaths um, were done slightly differently both in 2013 and now, although the hospitalized cases are, are very similar in the sense that they're uh, based on the emerging infections program cases. 
Uh, in uh, 2013, there was a way that we tried to use uh, death certificate data. Um, it, it just so happened that it kind of corresponded to an estimate if we'd made if we'd done it the same way we're doing it now. I real, realize. Um, let me let me just also point out. I should have pointed out, and I think I can use the pointer here that um, these are in 2017. Just so keep that in mind. Um, so the 12,800 deaths was um, actually an attempt to look at attributable deaths. Remember that people um, with costume difficile infection are often have a lot of underlying illnesses and uh, they can die, unfortunately, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, some of the deaths can be attributed to costume difficile infection. And we do this estimate by applying the percentage of deaths in people with Clostridium difficile infection who are thought to have the Clostridium difficile as the cause of death, the tribal deaths. And that's what this is. It was around 5%. Uh, if, if you do the math on 224,000, um, this comes out to around 5%, a little bit over 5%. Uh, and that is thought to be the uh, attributable mortality of a of a Clostridium difficile infection among hospitalized cases. Um, that's an important caveat. So that's what this, this estimate is. Um, and this next slide uh, just talks about uh, what, and this is in the report, and I encourage you to look at the report. Um, you can see the, the link to it here. Um, and you know, 224,000 uh, or just under 224,000 cases and deaths, and um, this is in contrast to 250,000 and 14,000 deaths, but these were looked at a little a different way. Um, these um, were uh, requiring hospitalization or already hospitalized. That was also true here, although it said not available. Um, and there are some other caveats that make it uh, different the way these were measured. So. They're not directly comparable, and that's what we say here. But, but in in some broad terms, when I say they're comparable, they're maybe in very very broad terms. At least they're going in the right direction there. Um, and um, then, consistent with that is in this report. I'm not showing you as a graph um, from 2012. You know, one year after this, this was based on 2011 data. This 2013 report even though it says the 2013 report, it was some 2011 data. Uh, then this is from 2012 and 2017 using all the exact same methods of this, and that did show a decrease. So overall, the good news in the air threat report is among hospitalized cases, there appears to be a decrease, um, and that's uh, more of what we're gonna show um, here, or consistent with what we're gonna show here. So just at the beginning of this month, so that was the AR threats report from last fall, uh, the same data source, this is a fuller report just published in the New England Jur Journal of Medicine, again, the Emerging Infections Program data. Um, and this, I haven't talked a lot about that, but it's um, uh, 10 uh, population centers across the United States. Uh, they're what we call catchments, contiguous uh, segments of the population, uh, in which and one or two of them might be entire states. Um, on the whole, there are about 14 million people uh, under surveillance in these populations, but that, of course, is you know just as a fraction of the 330 million people in the United States, or, or more than that now. Um, but uh, with that, uh, we can actually make an estimate for the total U.S. cases of C. difficile, and uh, this was done published back in the New England Journal back in 2014 for the year 2011. And now it's been, it was just published here in 2019 uh, through 2017. Um, and we actually went back and reanalyzed some of the data for 2011. Um, so slightly different from that, but than the previous report, but just because of some little changes, small changes in the way that some of the analysis was done. And you can see here um, two lines. Um, uh, the actual burden estimate over that time, which does show some declines in recent years in the actual burden. But remember, a big 
issue with tracking uh, Clostridium difficile infections over time is the differences, the vast differences in the sensitivity um, and also sometimes the specificity, the sensitivity of the different diagnostic tests. And, and if you go back to the year 2011, uh, about half of all labs were using an enzyme immunoassay, an enzyme test for a toxin. Um, and about half of the time were using uh, a PCR, a nucleic acid amplification test, a molecular test, we say, where you amplify up a molecular signal of C. difficile. And we know that that is much more sensitive than the EIA, the toxin test. And so a lot of this um, uh, sort of sustained in increase over this period um, was probably because more and more facilities were shifting towards these PCR tests. In fact, out here in 2017, you'd find that uh, over 70% of all the hospitals at, at this time, all the labs, I should say, were using those more sensitive PCR tests. So what we did is we went back and, and modeled um, the differences in sensitivity and looked at if the same amount of uh, laboratories were using EIA te or PCR tests now in 2017 as they were back in 2011. This is, or and over time, this is what the line would look like. So uh, this, this is sometimes called a counterfactual where you try to take into account uh, a, a, some type of surveillance artifact, in this case, the type of diagnostic test being used. Um, so there is a small decline in overall measured cases, even with more sensitive tests. Um, but then when you account for the differences in testing, you see a much more dramatic uh, decrease in incidence. Um, so that's that. And this now breaks that. That was overall. This was overall total CDI cases. This breaks it down into those which are community associated versus healthcare associated. This is a little complex when I was just talking to you about hospitalized cases and non-hospitalized cases. In fact, I'll show you how some of these different things kind of crosswalk with each other. Uh, but community associate means that they have not had any inpatient healthcare exposure for 12 weeks. Uh, healthcare associate means they have stayed overnight in an inpatient healthcare facility in the past 12 weeks. And you can see, and that includes, so this includes the healthcare associate includes hospital onset, includes nursing home onset, uh, but also includes community onset where people had been recently discharged. So you can see that the, the decline um, is more dramatic um, uh, in the, um, well, in fact, the decline is, is really completely explained by these declines in healthcare associated cases. Whereas this, um, when you look at the community associated cases, when you look at the crude uh, uh, instance of cases, it um, and the estimated numbers, estimated numbers on the left of all these instances on the right, uh, you can see that it appears to be increasing. Or actually, when you do the analysis on this, it's not significantly increasing. Um, actually, in, neither of these lines are significantly different um, over time. Um, or oh, actually, I'm qualify that. I think this is a real increase in uh, the measured uh, cases, community associated cases. But this line, uh, again, of the adjusted cases is level. So I think the bottom line of all this is that we are seeing progress. And I'll show you some more of that. There's other areas you can see this progress. Overall, in healthcare associated CDI, community associated CDI is just staying level, we're not making progress. And when you look at the measured number of cases, we're, we're seeing increases. But when you adjust for the test type, uh, we're seeing a level. Uh, so uh, remember that uh, this is sort of trying to show you again, maybe I should have started with this, um, but it helps you understand what we're talking about. With this EIP program, the Emerging Infections Program I mentioned, you really do get to see the overall epidemiology of C. difficile infections in terms of where they have their onset and whether they're healthcare associated. You can see in gray here, those are all the healthcare associated. This is now in 2017. And if we had a, uh, a pie chart like this from, 20, from 2011, we'd see that it looks a lot different. Um, back at that time, healthcare associated was, was, was all of this plus 
a fraction of that. So community associate is now taking a bigger part of, part of the pie. About half of all C. diff cases are now community associated. Um, and at about half, actually, I think it's now in 2018, more than half are community associated. But remember, the community associated can include um, uh, people, most of them are people who've had some outpatient exposures to so doctor's offices, dentist's office. Some have no exposures, but that's clearly the minority. Uh, and then the healthcare associate can have onset in the hospital, nursing home, and uh, recent inpatient exposures that have their community onset. Um, and oh, this actually shows the changes. I'm sorry, I should have said that, that here it is from 2011 to 2017, just what I was talking about, how the pies, a piece of the pie are changing uh, as we're seeing declines in healthcare associated CDI. Uh, now, I'm gonna shift now perspectives and I've just been showing you the overall pie charts from the Emerging Infections Program, which again, gives us the greatest detail. But um, what we wanna show you for the rest of this presentation is um, how we're trying to make more of the C. diff cases count that are reported in the National Healthcare Safety Network, NHSN. NHSN is our other major surveillance system. And uh, in fact, it's, it's much bigger in terms of the states where all 50 states are represented and all um, acute care hospitals in the United States uh, enter data into NHSN. Uh, but they only enter data for uh, hospitalized cases of C. difficile or cases that that they have access to. Uh, there are no cases being reported into NHSN from say um, a, a laboratory that only serves outpatient labs, uh, outpatient uh, uh, services, let's say. So if someone uh, maybe got their stool, they maybe they self-collected stool samples and uh, brought them to a laboratory in the community, those results would never get into NHSN. Now, a lot of, emer a lot of uh, outpatient C. difficile infections are diagnosed in emergency rooms. Not all those patients are admitted. Um, some of them are sent back home. Some of that data is collected into NHSN, but we are focusing right now on just the uh, cases that get admitted. So again, this goes back to that whole idea of hospitalized cases. So if you look at uh, an NHSN hospital, what are they doing? Well, they're reporting all the cases that get hospitalized uh, in their hospital. And think of that as this larger blue um, circle. Some of those are hospital onset, and that is traditionally where we have been focusing. When you hear about the uh, standardized infection ratio, um, that's all about, that's a standardized ratio uh, that accounts for, for risk factors, but it's all about measuring declines in the hospital onset infections and adjusting those by various things, including the test type used. And that all goes into the SIR. And that's been the focus that's been thought of as the main measure that hospitals can really impact because it's all within the four walls, so to speak. But there are all these other cases that they're reporting. And we know this is actually, although this is, the hospital just knows they're capturing all these cases that are coming from the community. They don't know where they're coming from though, always. I mean, sometimes they know that this patient was just in a nursing home. Um, if they just were in their hospital and they got uh, diagnosed out, well, they, they, they were discharged and then they come back with it, they'll know that. Um, but they won't know a lot about these patients. They'll just know that they weren't in their own hospital. They don't know if they were in some other hospital. Um, so we know from looking in the EIP data that we can figure out that Overall, this is about the breakdown that most hospitals see. Now, it's different in different hospitals, but generally about half of all the community onset cases uh, that are in this light blue crescent are community associated. About 40% are community onset with recent inpatient exposures. Most of those are from their own hospital exposure. They're coming back. And then there's these 12% that are nursing home onset that are getting admitted. Um, but you can see that um, from the population perspective, um, this is a little different. This is saying of all community associated cases, again, we know this from the EIP, about 30% get admitted, okay? Of all community onset cases with recent inpatient exposures, 
60% get admitted. Um, and nursing home cases, most of those end up staying in the nursing home, uh, but 30% do get admitted. So um, this is something we're really interested in trying to explore further and trying to understand how we might even be able to use uh, the emerging infections program data to better um, get a view in a state of, of all the, um, uh, you know, our dream would be able to come up with charts like these, this for every state. Um, and we're looking into if there might be ways we could model towards that end. Uh, because again, in a state like Nebraska or Iowa, there is no EIP program in those states. Um, how can they know something about their overall epidemiology? Well, we think the place to start is by getting all these blue crescent cases, the light blue crescent cases, all these community onset cases um, uh, presented uh, uh, publicly, uh, not by hospital, because again, this is not part of the measurement of performance improvement in hospitals, but by state. And that's what we had promised last year to you all on the Hill Day to get out. And we're almost there. Um, I We had promised to get it to you before this, but we're almost there. So. I'm gonna switch now um, to um, the uh, AR, uh, Patient Safety Portal, or the Antibiotic Resistance and Patient Safety Portal. Um, I hope you all have taken time to go visit this. You can find it. The, don't ignore this address, because this address is a private address that won't help you get there. <laughs> but you wanna just go to arpsp.cdc.gov. Is that the right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's the ARPSP, then the .cdc.gov. But one of my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, uh, I should know that by heart, and I do. But I'm just nervous. Okay. Uh, so let me just go. Like, if you land there, um, you will first, if you go into it, like I just told you, ARPSP.cdc.gov, uh, and you get in, you'll you'll land on this. Um, and I don't, I think maybe we've suppressed this data explorer. We're going to right now we're going to work on it some more, but you'll see these different tiles. You can see, you can uh, scroll over those, but, but if um, the main C. diff data is in the healthcare associated infections, because this is being reported as part of the CMS mandate for acute care hospitals to report their C. diff, their, their healthcare associated infections. And these are the, healthcare associated infections that are mandated for reporting from all, all acute care hospitals. And if you see C. difficile infections, um, you go to the profile um, and that's where uh, we get to this. Now, if you go there right now, because this is not quite live yet, um, and you look, we call these the hero stats. Um, I, think, I think this first hero stat might say something a little bit different than the uh, number of hospitals. Um, but the second hero stat will talk about C. diff infections, but the number there will only be like 69,000. Why is that? Um, well, I think that might be 69, it might even be 69,000 infections in 2018. I, yeah, I think it is. Um, but this is now 196,000. Well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that hero stat before was just showing you the hospital onset. Now, this is all the, basically almost all the infections being reported to NHSN, all those hospitalized, uh, in the hospitalized cases. And it says, you know, these are, uh, this reflects hospitalized patients with C. difficile infection, including the community onset and the hospital onset infections. Before it was just the hospital onset infections, now also the community onset infections across U.S. general acute care hospitals as reported in NHSN. Um, this changes over the time is that 29% decline in the SIR. And so I think you'll see that the, uh, the uh, SIR now in 2018 is 0.71, coming down from one. Um, again, that is really a measure in the performance improvement nationally across all U.S. hospitals and the reduction of hospital onset infections adjusted by other factors. Um, so um, now we're going to try to give you greater visual, visual, visualization on the total number of cases being reported to um, NHSN, including those community onset infections and 
Um, so if you scroll on down to the geographic uh, location, um, and you can see right away a little change here, C. difficile infection, SIR, that number sign will go away, and hospitalized infections um, by state, map. Uh, and you can see 2018. And you can see now when we scroll, we're going to see more data. We're going to see the SIR in California, uh, great reductions in their SIR in hospitals. And they've also instantly seen the reductions in the total hospitalized cases. You can see here in 2018, um, this is 16,768 patients. Um, and you can scroll over so uh, to other states, and you can see those total number of patients hospitalized with C. difficile infection is reported to NHSN and, and all these. And so um, you can go, and yeah, I, one thought was that you all could use these to better uh, articulate to policymakers and others about the number of people affected um, in your state. Um, and that was our goal. Um, and uh, this new feature also, you can enlarge in the map just by scrolling. Um, and this does have other years. Now, um, so this is um, 16. Um, and so I said in California, they've had the kind of will go back to 15. Uh, so you can see it more dramatically. <coughs> In California, I think they were at 16,000, but back in 15, they were at 27,000 um, total hospitalized cases. Now, we don't yet have a way of um, showing changes over time in the individual states, um, but I do think we have changes over time uh, down here in, uh, this is the SIR data. Um, okay, not right now, but... Um, this is just SIR, um, but I think that will be something also nationally. I think we'll first nationally have uh, the uh, ability to look over time at the national number um, of cases. Uh, whoops, this is touchy. Okay, um, so I think that that is um, really about all I had, um, let me see, go back, yes, yep. So um, any questions, I guess, we'll open it up. Any questions? Hey, Cliff, you may have to give it a second because there's a delay on the, sure. the video. So I suspect we will get questions. Okay. I want to just take the moment if everyone can hear me. Um, oh, yeah, they can hear you. Oh, yeah, just give a shout out to Preeta Cuddy. She actually did all the work on these slides. Thank you, Preeta. Um, Preeta is uh, joining me in the science office, and she um, is a great asset, and I hope that um, she can further get to interact with uh, this great organization. Andrew Dene is the uh, programmer uh, who has done all this work on the um, ARPSP, and we've really been delighted with uh, this development. Well, here's an interesting question, Cliff. Um, on asks, has there been any data looking at C. diff rates following pandemic outbreaks of H1N1 or SARS? Interesting you bring that up. Uh, Monitor the outbreaks in 2003 4 in Montreal, 2003 and 2004, um, you know, occurred really on the heels of SARS. Um, Montreal was not as affected as Toronto, of course, um, but um, um, that, that was very interesting anyway. That also sometimes I think we're always concerned that. You shift your attention away from one problem and another problem comes back on you. Um, and um, I don't know about H1N1, but, um, I, but I will, you know, that, that is a one point around 2003 when was a lot of things started to break loose in C. difficile uh, in the current era. Um, and there's been other work to show that C. diff rates seem to correlate over time uh, with the influenza rates, 
Uh, they, they occur about a month or two. I mean, their peak of C. diff is a little like about a month or two after the peak in influenza. And it also seems to vary by year. Um, bad influenza years in recent decades have been marked by the H3N2 strain. Um, and they tend to be more severe and C. diff infections tend to be higher in those years. Uh, do, you of the antibiotic use. Yeah. So do you think that's because you end up with more bacterial pneumonia following a bad flu season? So therefore increase antibiotic use? Yeah, I think that's, that's the thought. So we could very well see that. Very uh, well could, yeah. 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 We have a little yeah. bit of distance. Right. Um, so we have a question from Anna Diaz asking, um, how do we envision accounting for more of the community acquired cases? Yeah, the community associated, that is a challenge. Um, and I don't, I like I said, one goal we have is to try to model um, if we can uh, and project what they might be based upon the number that get hospitalized, realizing that only about a third of them are hospitalized. Um, our thinking there might be, and again, this is just, this is still just exploratory, is if we took a, the other data sources, like what are the factors that um, are most predictive for someone getting hospitalized um, within a certain area, uh, the number of facilities, the number of doctors, the overall patient care, maybe socioeconomics. So this is one area of research. Um, that is uh, short of making C. difficile reportable in each and every case, uh, which has its pluses and minuses to it. Um, we don't have another way right now. Um, Laboratory-based uh, surveillance um, could help. Um, we do have some of these cases getting reported in the emergency room, but um, how we could do with that alone, I don't know. So I don't have a full answer or how best to do that community associated cases. Yeah. Um, so Gerard has a question. Is there a consensus regarding the causes of decreases in healthcare associated C. diff? Um, the causes of decreases? Uh, well, let's start with the very positive. There has been improved antibiotic uh, stewardship. There has been a decline in hospitals more than in the community, incidentally in uh, fluoroquinolone use. Overall, antibiotics have not uh, declined significantly in the community, but they have shifted some. In, in hospitals, they've also probably not overall declined, but they've shifted from different risk classes like the fluoroquinolones have uh, decreased. And the fluoroquinolones probably are very important for selecting the epidemic strain and the epidemic strain, the 027 strain, um, has higher attack rates, it just causes more infection where it's around. So controlling that strain by using fewer of the fluoroquinolones has probably played a role. Another uh, factor has probably been improved infection control. I think we should think that it has is when you measure things closely and um, publicly report on them, like the hospitalized SIR, hospitalized case SIR, the hospital onset SIR. Um, that they do go down because there's reputation, reputational costs for the facilities. There's real financial costs for the facilities. So paying more attention to infection control and antibiotic stewardship. And then thirdly, uh, there is increasing recognition that uh, along with the adoption of the more sensitive PCR testing, there was not the uh, equal adoption of good use of the test. And there was probably early on a lot of overuse and overtesting mm -hmm. been increased emphasis on being more thoughtful and, and thinking about uh, diagnostics in the same way we do think about antibiotics and that is diagnostic stewardship. Uh, all these tests, any test, any diagnostic test um, is really dependent upon the population you use it in. Um, and clostridium difficile infection is really what you call a clinical diagnosis, it cannot be made with a laboratory test alone. At least we don't have one right now that will do that. If you order a toxin test, even though it's less sensitive, but you do it in the wrong population, you will get positives that don't really mean 
this person is infected with C. difficile. And this is especially true with C. difficile because it causes colonization as well as infection. And these problems are only amplified when you use a molecular test. So, so the three things really are improved infection control, antibiotic stewardship, and now diagnostic stewardship. That's more in the recent one or two, three years. Um, so Lauren has a question uh, asking, does CDC work with FDA in regards to treating recurrent C. diff infections, uh, i.e. antibiotics versus FMTs? I don't really think you guys do that. No, no. We, I mean, we interact with them occasionally, but... Yeah, that is more of an FDA question, Lauren, and um, I, we went and uh, talked to FDA about that last November. Um, so this actually might be a Michael Craig <laughs> question rather than a Cliff McDonald question. <laughs> uh, but Kevin McDermott asks, will any of the 500 million given to CDC for infrastructure in the, C in the CARES Act apply to better reporting on C. diff? It's more, more of a... Yeah, it's more of a Michael Craig question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Kevin, uh, my understanding is that that funding is for overall sort of data infrastructure. And so I think the better our data infrastructure is, the better our reporting will be overall. Um, but I don't think any of it is targeted at CDIF, is my understanding. Um, and I think that's sort of out of Cliff's wheelhouse. Um, Kimberly asks, are FMT still considered experimental? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Mm. Um, I mean, they're not approved well, per se. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that there's not an FDA approval for them, it's under enforcement discretion. And I think they do. FDA says you should get informed consent. Of course, a lot of procedures you get informed consent for, anyway. So. Yeah. Um, so then Donna asked, is there any data on, uh, I guess what she's asking is, any data on antibiotics, uh, like what percentage of C. diff is precipitated by antibiotics um, as opposed to not? Yeah, you know, okay, yeah, there is data on that. Um, and probably, I'm, I'm not trying to think of recent data on, I think the question becomes, how many, what proportion of all C. diff cases have received antibiotics in the previous 12 weeks? Right. Uh, and uh, we do know that in the community, it's a lower proportion than in any of the other cases. The community associated, it's the lowest, but even then it's over half. But it's not, not I mean, there was a time we always said it was almost an absolute requirement to have C. difficile, and I think know from the last 10, 15 years that that's no longer the case, that people seem to get C. difficile, um, a portion, the minority, but not a small minority, but a, a minority, do get C. difficile antibiotics in the community. In, in the hospital, almost all patients have had antibiotics in the last mm -hmm. Uh, Julie asks, are quinolones still the most frequent agents associated with the disease? No, they are no longer. Um, they probably were never the most frequent just because there's so many other antibiotics used even more frequently. I mean, fluoroquinolones, well, fluoroquinolones were actually of classes, some of the most frequently used. And so let me qualify it. Maybe they were the most frequently associated. Now, the most frequently associated are cephalosporins. Um, and that's especially true in the hospital where uh, fluoroquinolones have decreased in use so much. And so cephalosporins are also um, a higher risk drug and they are probably driving a lot of the C. difficile now we're seeing. All right, so the last question that we have is from Susanna Rodriguez. Uh, and she asks, uh, it's very interesting that when the data is normalized, the sensitivity specificity of testing methods, there are two observations slash conclusions, increasing versus decreasing CDI incidence. When the data is not normalized, the sensitivity specificity of the testing, the CDI incident indicates that it is increasing over time. So then what is the real incidence? Are we over-diagnosing with 
Uh, I think she's actually like nuclear, uh, nuclear. Testing, uh, how do we account for asymptomatic carriage? I think you kind of addressed some of that when you were talk, like, talking a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the EIP data were uh, longitudinal data. Um, the New England Journal paper. Um, I'm just trying to be sure I state this all correctly. Overall, there is a small decline in the overall number of cases without adjustment for the test type. Um, that's all from the, it's all driven by the healthcare associated cases. When you adjust for test type, um, it's a more dramatic decline in the healthcare associated cases. Um, when you do not, okay, so let me just start with the unadjusted. Unadjusted, overall small decline, increase in the community associated, decrease in the healthcare associated. That's unadjusted. When you do the adjustment, it is a overall decrease, level in the community associated, sort of flat line, and a more dramatic decrease in the healthcare associated. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, there, well, there, there is both. There was probably the underdiagnosis back in 2011, some, uh, but definitely overdiagnosis as PCR tests came on without the appropriate judicial use of those. Well, I mean, that's all we have, and we have a minute left in your presentation yeah. time, so that worked out really well. Um, I want to thank you so, so much, Cliff, for taking the time. Um, uh, we just got one more question. Read the data published in New England Journal of Medicine. If one person experiences recurrence CDF, is each recurrence counted as a separate case or do all of their recurrences count as one case? That data in there was only first recurrence. Okay, so only first recurrence. Um, all right, well, thank you so, so okay. much, Cliff. Thank, um, you. And thank you to Andrew and Prita for all of their important work to get us here. Um, yes. And then next up for those